So I'll talk uh, about work which has been done after the release of Planck data, mostly uh, work with Linde and Ferrara and Parati and uh, Rost and Van Proen. And so what we have shown this uh, map, which is so beautiful here, and then um, the data which we'll analyze here uh, is a primordial tilt and the ratio of tensor to scalar uh, fluctuations, which is coming from analysis which George described for us. And so why all of this is so important? Because cosmological observation can tell us about fundamental physics at energy scale up to 10 to the 16 GV, which is about 10 or in principle, in 10 orders of magnitudes above LHC. And even if we will probably hear from NIMA, we'll have 100 TV accelerator in China. It's still a long way to 10 to the 16 GV. So we should at least remember that uh, cosmology in principle is capable of giving us information of very high energy. And it is up to us to try to, to get this information. So I'll, now I'll talk about um, now that uh, we have this uh, blue spot and dark blue spot, which ruled out many, many inflationary models, because five years ago, all of this was uh, possible. And not anymore. We are in a rather small parameter uh, uh, part. And so the discussion will be either anything special about the models, which are at the sweet spot of the Planck data. And so we ask this question, and we are trying to give answers. And the answers is not what something which we expected a little bit ago. ago. So the paradigm which seemed to emerge is the following, that the standard Einstein frame, which has minimal coupling to scalars, and everybody has seen this Lagrangian, one half R and Planck equals one. We have a canonical kinetic term for scalar, and we have some potential. It is this potential which codifies uh, all information which we compare with this uh, primordial tilt and uh, ratio of uh, uh, tensor to scalar fluctuation. It is coming from this uh, form. And the, the potential is proportional to the uh, square of Hubble scale uh, of Hubble parameter during inflation. So the way to ask questions before, so when we will have more and more data, we will know what this potential is. And there is a, something called Encyclopedia Inf Inflationary, which has hundreds of models. And uh, the idea was that by the end of the day, we will know which one or some class of models are the best fit to data. And the current understanding is that it is probably not the best way to analyze the data. Instead, if you start with something which is known as Jordan frame, with non-minimal coupling of scalars to gravity, which means that in front of Einstein term, there is some particular um, term depending on scalars. And there is some kinetic term and something which is called Jordan frame potential. And this is where we find a rather interesting uh, richness of possibilities of explaining this, uh, the, uh, the models which are sitting in this dark blue region of space. Something is not, can somebody help me to move? Oh, okay, thanks. So, uh, the first indication that something interesting is happening when you start using the non-minimal coupling was known for a few years. So you start with phi to d4 model, which was sitting here for uh, 60 or 50 foldings. It was a long time ago ruled out uh, from, from the map, and it was so far from the data. Then you add psi over 2 phi squared r term with tiny, two times 10 to the minus three value of xi, and it is already inside the data. Then you go a little bit further to uh, 100, and you are basically inside here, 
and uh, uh, very close to the Starobinsky model, which is R plus R squared. This was known for a while. What was interesting that it was the first indication of critical behavior, that there is something uh, significant happening at small changes of uh, uh, important parameters. And this is how it always happened, and many string theorists know, uh, know about black, black hole attractors. Once you find the first one, then there are many other examples, and there is something like universality here. Okay, so the way to understand the data from, from our perspective, the best way is to start with generalization of the same idea, and let's start with completely arbitrary potential in Jordan frame and add the analog of psi phi squared, which is now uh, some zeta r square root of v, and see what will happen. Uh, what is happening is rather striking. You then go to the Einstein frame, Oops. and you find um, a new Lagrangian, which has just r without scalar coupling, certain kinetic term for scalars, and this is the, the potential which you discover. No matter how you start, you end up with this interesting uh, potential. And this is the situation where, which brings you to extremely flat region, and then you immediately have, independently of the original potential, you have uh, the same observational consequence, you have a plateau, and at small zeta, it is your original theory, which could be anything you want, but then it starts um, uh, growing and you interpolate exactly as in case of Higgs inflation versus Tarabinsky model. Actually, it is a property of any of these uh, models. So we call this mechanism combing chaotic inflation. You can start with phi to the four, phi cubed, phi squared, phi, phi to the power two third, and you just imply, uh, you add this uh, coupling, and you see what happens. It is even easy to explain why all of these lines eventually end up at the same place. And so this is uh, what I'm showing you in the logarithmic scale. You obviously see an attractor, and the way you approach the attractor, and the value of the spectral index depend on number of E foldings, which is 50 or 60, and the value of uh, B modes, again, depend just on number of E foldings, and you could, could have started any place here, and you end up here if you uh, um, add this non-minimal coupling. This was simply unexpected. So, one of the explanations which we believe is behind this mechanism is the fact that if you would like to use superconformal symmetry, by construction, you always have to put in front of R some function of scalars. Uh, for experts, it is known as scalar potential of embedding manifold. It just has to be there. And then uh, if you choose the simplest versions, and then you add the superpotential with particular arbitrary function of the ratio of these two fields which have conformal weight, you end up with a function in Jordan frame which is totally arbitrary function, but when you go to Einstein frame, the result is uh, totally universal. And so the mechanism which has place here is of the following nature. You start with extremely bad potential, whatever, as bad as you like, uh, and this is a function of these geometric objects on which this function defining conformal symmetry of the model depends. And then at the moment when you uh, move from Jordan frame to Einstein frame, this is what happens. You have this flattening of the potential, and in the end, uh, the prediction for the observables are totally independent of the choice of the potential here. And so this is your resulting model. And again, you have just Einstein frame curvature, you have a kinetic term, and then you have an arbitrary function of something which is tangent of the uh, canonical field in Einstein frame. And so this phenomenon is rather uh, peculiar, but it absolutely helps to explain everything we see. 
And so later on, we moved a little bit. This is one of the models which may be particularly interesting for, uh, from string theory perspective. This is what happens here. You start, we call it super conformal alpha model. So you start with SU11 over U1 symmetry, and every string theorist have seen it. And uh, then you add a very uh, interesting Higgs effect so that you have either massive vector or massive tensor. And this is your kinetic term. And there is a factor alpha in front. And the potential is rather simple. Then you move to canonical field and you find exactly the same structure you have seen before. But now there is this new factor alpha here and it turns out to be a curvature of the Keller manifold which is rather interesting because you will see in a moment that these alpha models have a new attractor value and this new attractor value has the same tilt of spectra which depends only on number of E folding. But the value of R got this factor alpha. So it still depends on the number of E folding but it has also an additional factor here. So the earlier models would have alpha equals one. So uh, then we realize that once you have one attractor, as we have seen many times in models where we use supergravity and string theory in approach to the horizon, you always have many more models. And this is exactly what happened here. For a while, we couldn't find anything but one model with alpha attractor. In a very short time, it became clear that, um, oops, excuse me. So what happened here that you can uh, find a beautiful superconformal model where you end up with just exactly the previous model which has a factor alpha here. And then again, we have this attractor picture. We could start with uh, the function f which is uh, phi to d4 or phi cube or phi squared or phi phi to over third. And then we start changing alpha, and they all go precisely in the place we would like to see them. And, but this new parameter is the curvature of the Keller manifold. And in this particular set of models, this attractor point has a new dependence on this small parameter, which is alpha. And there is an interesting relation between the Jordan frame uh, scalar and the canonical one. It is the same relation as between velocity and rapidity. And so velocity is limited by velocity of light, but rapidity is not. And this is precisely the canonical field which enters the observation from which we deduce the value of all cosmological observation, but it has also this geometrical nature associated with the famous SU11 over U1 space, which makes the story extremely interesting. So this is why I was uh, trying to understand the situation and this is complementary to what Eva and of course George already told us. Um, so this is what we know today. There are significant efforts in finding this parameter R. And the efforts are on South Pole as well as uh, in Chile and in some other future experiments. And so what is important here there is an agreement between people that eventually they will go uh, far enough by simply increasing the number of detectors. And so after Planck, there will be stage three and stage four eventually. And this will end up with the following uh, beautiful picture uh, from Chaolin Ku, who is here at Stanford and doing this measurement. And so what he uh, shows that, oops, eventually, this whole area will be swept by the data. And so we will reach stage four, we will reach the attractor point. And either there will be a discovery before, we will discover primordial B modes, which will be extremely interesting for thousands of reasons, or we will reach the bound, we will come to this attractor point, and that will be particularly interesting. So let me give you a summary on the cosmological attractor story, which I was trying to present, that there are seven, uh, several recently mo discovered models, 
and they're all related to superconformal supergravity. And they typically have extremely elegant uh, uh, versions of these models. Almost independently of the choice of the original Jordan frame potential, they lead to nearly identical um, inflationary potential when you go to Einstein frame. In this context, uh, we can have inflation even if we started in Jordan frame with rather steep potentials. And these theories, uh, they lead to identical cosmological prediction. And this by itself is not so fantastic, but the fact they are precisely uh, going in the sweet spot of Planck data. This is rather interesting. So the predictions uh, of generalized version of these theories continuously interpolate between their attractor values, which are down here, and various chaotic inflation models, which are either ruled out or marginal today. And so any discovery of uh, B modes somewhere here, we are ready to it. It will help us to get interpretation of any of these models. And so we really are looking for, for future data. So now back to future, let me formulate the, uh, the expectation. And the expectation is that uh, there isn't non-discovery for now of uh, non-Gaussianity. And the fact that we have the constraint on tensor, which says that R today is less than 0 0.1, shifted the focus of investigation from inflationary model producing non-Gaussian perturbation to theories at the sweet spot of Planck data. So what are the models which are today allowed? So a few years ago, we did not have any, many models with experimentally testable prediction with R between 10 to the minus 1 and 10 to the minus 3. Now we have a broad class of such models, many of them pointing out to the same direction, which is a cosmological attractor. And things which we would like to do are the following. Uh, on the theoretical side, we would like to better understand those sweet spot cosmological attractors, how to build the UV completion, what is precise relation to string theory, and especially to emergent data, because the new data may come any time from now, any day. And the experiment testing inflation all the way down to R to the 10 to the minus 3. And so here I'm making a following statement. If primordial gravitational waves are discovered or not discovered at the level of R, which is 3 times 10 to the minus 3, the simplest universal attractor models will be supported or falsified. And going below this level may allow us to measure the curvature of the modular space, which would be uh, really, really interesting. And I can only add that people who actually do the BMOD experiment, they say we'll get there. And so we'll, we'll see what will happen. Thank you. What do you expect in the next five years from the BMOD experiments? So number one, they will just sweep the area, find nothing. And when they come to 3 times 10 to the minus 3, we will know that the simplest attractor idea is falsified, or they will discover gravity waves before that. And this could happen any moment. Also, we will need an improvement on uh, tilt of the spectra. And I don't know how much George expects this to happen. And the number of e folding will also decide which of these spots are more or less reliable, because this depends on the final stages. OK, thank you, Renata.